Hello, welcome back. And we're going to start our second lecture on energy, introduction to energy. We're going to be talking about calorimetry. I think I have the technical difficulties worked out. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this lecture on calorimetry. So we're just going to backtrack just a little bit to cover some bases. I fixed a few things <clears throat> for this lecture. So we did talk about enthalpy, which is the, I didn't correct this thing, but is the energy change at constant pressure. So again, enthalpy is the energy change at constant pressure, and we denote the sign or the symbol H for it. And in chemical changes, there are two types of important work, electrical work, which is done by moving charged particles. Again, these are like redox reactions, because redox reactions and move uh, charged particles or electrons are moved around. So. Now pressure volume work, here we're talking about mechanical work. So a system is either contracting or expanding. We mentioned earlier about pressure volume work. When work is done on the system, the system contracts, volume decreases. When work is done on the surroundings, system expands, volume increases. And so this typically involves reactions that have gases. So if you have a reaction that involves gases, it's going to undergo pressure volume work. And so the equation for pressure volume work is negative P delta V. So P is some external pressure. Delta V is the change in volume of your system. And enthalpy equals the internal energy plus P delta V. And the where this comes from is, we look at the derivation, we know that internal energy is Q plus work. And we know that work is negative P delta V. So now if we substitute in negative P delta V for work, we get delta E equals Q minus P delta V. And if we constrain this to have a constant pressure, then delta E equals Q sub P. And again, Q sub P means that this is heat at constant pressure. Anytime you see a sub of another variable, it means it's constant minus the work. We rearrange this, we get QP is delta E plus P delta V, which is Q at constant pressure is delta H. So that's where delta H comes from. So now, how do we compare delta E and delta H? Because as we said on the previous slide, for delta H, you need delta E and the work to calculate delta H. So again, from this equation, we need delta E and the work to calculate delta H. So now we're going to compare delta E and delta H. And one thing about chemical reactions is that many reactions involve very little pressure volume work. And so what this means is in some cases we can approximate delta H to be delta E. Most reactions, energy change occurs in the transfer of heat. So typically in chemical reactions what you get is the transfer of heat and very little work. Or there's a lot of heat given off and a small amount of work done as well. So the heat is so much more than the work that you can approximate delta H to be delta E. And there are three types of chemical reactions we're gonna look at. The first type are reactions that don't involve gases. And these are things like precipitation reaction, acid-base reaction, 
redox reactions. And as we know from earlier chapters in uh, chemistry, we know that solids and liquids have very small volume changes. So since they have very small volume changes, we can approximate delta V to be zero, which means our work is zero. And therefore, delta H is approximately delta E. So if you know delta E, you can find delta H. The second class of reactions are ones where the amounts of moles of gas does not change. So that means the moles of gas on the reactant side and the moles of gas on the product side are the same number. And so when that happens, delta V is zero, the work is zero, and delta H equals delta E. And so an example of that is we take nitrogen gas plus oxygen gas, gives us nitrogen monoxide. We see that on the product side, we have two moles of gas, because it's a subscript G and the coefficient of two. On the product side, or excuse me, the reactant side, we have one mole of nitrogen and one mole of oxygen, and they're both gases. And so the net change in gases, delta mole of gas, equals two minus two, which equals zero. So there's no change in the moles of gas, so delta H equals, now equals delta E. The other reactions are when we have the amounts of moles of gas that change. And so here P delta V is not zero, but again, the heat that is produced is so much more than the work done that delta H can be approximately delta E. So in summary, the majority of the reactions, delta H equals delta E, or delta H is approximately delta E. Now for the third group, greater difference in change of moles of gas, means greater difference between delta H, delta E. So the more difference, the bigger the difference is in the moles of gas, oh, not equal. greater the difference between delta H and delta E. So the greater the difference in the moles of gas between reactants and products, <coughs> the, the less delta H will be approximate to delta E. Secondly, if reactants have more moles of gas than products, system contracts. If products So in summary, the only reaction where delta H equals delta E is the second group of reactants, reactions. The one where the moles of gas are the same on both sides of the equation. So let's look at an example here. We want to know which one of these reactions will the difference between delta H and delta E be the greatest. And so what we want to look at is we want to find which 
reaction has the greatest difference, greatest change in moles of gas. So the greater the difference in the moles of gas, the greater the difference will be between delta H and delta E. Let's take a look at this. So in A, we have a liquid. So moles of gas on the reactant side is zero. And on the product side, we have a liquid and we have one mole of gas. So the change in gases is one. Because again, zero moles of gas on the reactant side, one mole of gas on the product side, the change is one. Now on B, we have a solid on the reactant side, so this is zero. We have a solid on the product side, that's not a gas. And we have one mole of CO2. So again, delta N. And by the way, since the delta N is positive, or positive, that means that the system's going to expand. FYI, just extra information. Now on C, we have one mole of NO gas and one mole of ozone gas. So collectively, we have two moles of gas on the reactant side. And on the product side, we have one mole of NO2 one mole of O2. So collectively, we have two moles of gas on the product side. So now the change in moles would be zero. So what does this mean? This means that for C, delta H equals delta E. Now moving on down, Next, we have a combustion reaction. We have two moles of C2H6, seven moles of O2. This gives us a combined total of nine. On the reactant side, we have four moles of CO2 and six moles of H2O liquid. So since it's a liquid, we don't include it. So this has four on the product side. And so the change in moles would be negative five. So this system, D, would contract because there's more moles of gas on the reactant side versus the product side. Now we go to E. E has four moles of ammonia, five moles of oxygen gas. So collectively, we have nine. On the product side, we have four moles of NO, six moles of H2O. We have a total of 10 moles on the product side. So delta N would equal one. So in E, it would expand because there's a more moles of gas on the product side. So the correct answer, which one would have the greatest difference between delta H and delta E? It would be D, because D has the greatest difference in the moles of gas. Now, moving along. So in thermochemistry, a way we measure heat of chemical and physical changes is by using calorimetry. And so some properties of heat that we need to talk about <coughs> is that Q is proportional to the delta T. Oops, excuse me. So Q is proportional to delta T. So if we know delta T, we can find Q. And so Q, if we know delta T, we multiply by some constant, 
we can find the Q. Or if we know the Q and the delta T, we can calculate what this constant is. And so in calorimetry, there's this two forms of this constant. This constant is referred to as heat capacity. Heat capacity is the heat, how much heat is needed to change the temperature by one Kelvin or one degree Celsius. So the unit can be joule per Kelvin or it can be joule per degree C as well. They're both the same, doesn't matter which one you use. So this is an extensive property. And if you can reflect back to your chapter on uh, units and measurements, extensive property means it depends on the amount of matter. So if you have more of a particular substance, you're gonna have a different heat capacity. And the way we find heat capacity, again, is we take the Q divided by delta T, we get the heat capacity. So this is an extensive physical property involving heat for substances. Next we have the specific heat, which is given typically the lowercase c symbol. Now let's look at this definition. The quantity of heat required to change the temperature of one gram of substance by one Kelvin. Again, this can also be one degree Celsius as well. The units can be joule per gram Kelvin or synonymous with joule per gram times degree Celsius. So either joule per gram Kelvin or joule per gram degree Celsius, as long as whichever one you use, the temperature is in that unit. And so the way we find specific heat is we take the Q divided by the mass times the delta T, or we commonly rearrange this equation to give us what's called Q equals MCAT. And specific heat is an intensive physical property. What does intensive physical property mean? It means it's not dependent on the amount of matter. So you can use specific heat. So each substance has its own unique specific heat. And so to give you an example of specific heat, <clears throat> aluminum has a higher specific heat than uh, iron or cast iron. And if you, ever, if you ever go to the stove and you cook with an aluminum pan and cook with a cast iron pan, the cast iron pan will heat up faster because it has a lower specific heat than an aluminum pan. Just to give you an idea of how that works. So one other type of uh, physical property of heat, let me erase this for you, is molar heat capacity. So molar heat capacity is usually given the capital C, and it's the exact same thing as specific heat, except it's involving one mole of substance instead of one gram. And so sometimes problems may give you grams in the molar heat capacity, or they may give you moles and the specific heat. So the way you go from molar heat capacity to specific heat is by dividing by the molar mass of your substance. So these are the three physical properties of heat. And so with calorimetry, there are two major types of calorimetry, and they both utilize what's called a calorimeter. Calorimeter is a device used to measure the heat released or absorbed by a physical change or chemical process. And the first type of calorimetry we're going to discuss is constant pressure calorimetry. 
and with constant pressure calorimetry, you're going to use this Q equals MC delta T equation. Again, M is mass, C is specific heat, delta T is the change in temperature. And this is Q at constant P. So the heat transferred is at constant pressure, and we generally use a coffee cup calorimeter to measure this change. And so a few things now. If we assume that the calorimeter does not absorb any heat, this makes things a lot easier. And this is the fundamental uh, principle of calorimetry. So the heat released from the solid, which is referred to as the system, maybe it's negative cube system, negative cube solid, they all mean the same thing. And the heat is absorbed by the water, which is the surroundings, or we could say Q of water. And so this right here is the fundamental principle you have to remember to do calorimetry. The heat released by the solid is the negative heat released by the solid is equal to the heat absorbed by the water. If you don't remember this, you cannot do calorimetry problems. Now, if the calorimeter absorbs some heat, then we have to include the heat absorbed by the calorimeter. So again, the heat released by the solid is still our system. However, the heat absorbed by the water and the calorimeter now. Notice before it was just the water, but now it's the calorimeter. So the surroundings now equal the water plus calorimeter. And you'll know in the problem if it's the calorimeter absorbs heat because it'll give you information about the calorimeter as well. And so therefore, the heat released by the solid is equal to the, the negative heat released by the solid is equal to the heat absorbed by the water and the calorimeter. So this involves an extra step when the calorimeter absorbs heat. In most problems, say most, majority of problems, usually they assume the calorimeter does not absorb any heat. And so this is what a coffee cup calorimeter looks like. You have your coffee cup, in here is where the reaction occurs, you measure the temperature as well. And if you take, usually this lab is done in General Chemistry 1 or General Chemistry 2, they do it as well, coffee cup calorimetry. So let's look at a problem involving uh, coffee cup calorimetry. So here we have a mass of a sample of shiny, orange looking metal, orange brown metal. It's heated to 65 degrees Celsius, so you would heat this in a separate water bath. Make sure it's at 65 degrees Celsius. You then add the metal to 25 grams of water in a coffee cup calorimetry, calorimeter, sorry. And the temperature change of the water goes from 25.55 to 27.25 degrees Celsius. So what is the unknown metal? So this 27.25 degrees Celsius is also the final temperature of the metal as well. So what we're looking for is we need to find the specific heat of the solid in order to determine the identity. Because once we know the specific heat of a solid, we can look at a table and determine the identity of the metal. So in order to calculate the specific heat of the solid, we need the heat that was released by the solid, the mass of the solid, and delta T. And again, I'm sorry, this should be capital T, not lowercase t. So let's see what we have to do this problem. So in order to find the Q of the solid, remember that the negative Q of solid equals the Q of water. So if we can determine the Q of water, we can find the Q of solid. So the Q of water is equal to the mass of water times the specific heat times delta T. Now for water, it's a very common uh, substance used, so its specific heat is not usually given because it's understood that you should look this up or know it. And so the specific heat of water is 4.184 joule per gram. Your 
degrees C. So again, sometimes with water, it won't give you this specific heat. It's understood. And if we know the delta T, we know the delta T went from 25.55 to 27.25. And we know the mass is 25 grams of water. So we can determine the Q of water. So we plug those in. Remember, it's always final minus initial. We can calculate the Q of water. Now to find the Q of solid, we just take the negative of it. And now we have the heat release by this metal. We can then plug in the Q of solid. We know the mass of the solid and we know its temperature change. Remember temperature change is final minus initial. And we can calculate the specific heat. So once you know the specific heat, you can look this up in a table. And we get the identity of this material is, or this substance is copper. Give you a few seconds to look that over before we continue. Look at another example. So here we want to know we have, well, we don't want to know, we have a problem involving 240 grams of water. So we have some mass of water. It's initially at 20 degrees Celsius. It's mixed with an unknown mass of iron that's initially at 500 degrees Celsius. When equilibrium is reached, the system has a temperature of 42 degrees Celsius. What's the mass of the iron? So this 42 degrees Celsius here, this is the final temperature of the iron and the water. And it gives us a specific heat of iron here. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the mass of iron. So the equation we're going to use is, is Q equals MC delta T because this is coffee cup calorimetry. So to solve for the mass, we need the heat released by the iron, its specific heat, and its delta T. Well, we already got its specific heat. It's given to us delta T we can find because T initial is 500, T final is 42. We're just missing the Q of iron. So what is the Q of iron? Once we know that, we can find the mass of iron. So what we have to remember is the fundamental principle of coffee cup calorimetry, the heat released by the iron is absorbed by the water. So we can determine how much heat the water absorbed. We can determine how much heat was released by the iron. And it didn't mention anything about the calorimeter, so we know that there was no heat absorbed by the calorimeter. So for water, we know the mass of water, we know its specific heat, and we know its delta T. We can calculate the heat absorbed by the water. So about 22,092 joules. Now, if you're a little bit off from what I get, it's fine. I don't, I'm not a big stickler for rounding. If you got 22093, that's fine, no problem. Now that we know the Q of water, we can find the Q of iron. We just make it negative. We plug it in, we find the mass of iron. So the mass of iron used was 107 grams of iron. So again, the fundamental principle, I like to stress this because if you don't know this, you can't do the problem, is the heat released by the iron is the heat absorbed by the water. That is fundamental. Now we'll do one last coffee cup calorimeter problem. Maybe not one last one. We got two more, I think. Involving chemical reactions. So here we have 
50 milliliters of a 0.5 molar solution of barium hydroxide and the same volume and concentration of HCl. So this is an acid base reaction. And this is done in a coffee cup. This is very similar to the problem you, uh, example you would do in the lab. You found that the Q of solution is 1.386 kilojoules. Calculate delta H for the reaction in kilojoules per mole of H2O formed. So what we're looking for is the delta H. And delta H in this case would be the Q of reaction divided by the moles of water. So we need to find the moles of water. We need to find the Q of reaction. So what we're given is the information about each reactant and we're given the Q of solution. So since this is an acid base reaction, we have to write a balanced chemical equation. So barium hydroxide HCl gives us barium chloride and H2O. We know the fundamental principle of coffee cup calorimetry, Q of reaction equals negative Q of solution. So we find the Q of solution, we can find the Q of reaction. And the Q of solution is given to us up here, 1.386 kilojoules. So now we can find Q of reaction, we just make it negative. The next thing we need to do is find the moles of water. So we gotta determine which one produce which reactant produces the fewer moles of water to determine. Now get this, the limiting reactant. So we take barium hydroxide, find out the moles of water produced, 0.05 moles. We take HCl, determine the moles of water produced, 0.025 moles. So since uh, HCl produces the fewer moles of product, it's the limiting reactant. So then we take the moles of water produced by the limiting reactant and the, the Q of reaction, and we can find the delta H. Typically, delta H is given in kilojoules. And this delta H better be exothermic because generally when you have an acid-base reaction, it is exothermic. Look at one last problem involving uh, coffee cup calorimetry. So in this problem, we have equal volumes and concentrations of HCl and sodium hydroxide. So this is going to be an acid-base reaction. We mix them in a coffee cup calorimeter. Before the solutions were mixed, the initial temperature was 25.1 degrees Celsius. Once we mix them, we get a final temperature of 27.78. What's the molar enthalpy of neutralization of the acid? So since we're interested in the molar enthalpy of neutralization of the acid, we want to look to see how many moles of acid were used. Now molar entropy of neutralization is just a fancy way of saying molar entropy of the reaction. Because when you have an acid-base reaction, usually you're neutralizing either the acid or the base. And it tells us the specific heat capacities is 4.2. So they have the same specific heats, the same densities. So delta H is Q of reaction divided by N. So we know the heat of the reaction and the moles. In this case, we're interested in the moles of HCl. Getting better at this freehand, HCl. We have our chemical equation. Notice that everything's a one-to-one -one mole ratio. Now remember, the fundamental principle, Q of reaction, is negative Q of solution. So we can find the Q of solution. We can find the Q of reaction. So we know the mass of solution is 400 grams because, again, it's one gram per milliliter, the density. 
And since we have 200 milliliters of each, there's a total of 400 grams. So here we have the mass of solution, we have the specific heat of the solution, and we have the delta T. Again, delta T is always final minus initial. And we get the heat absorbed by the solution. Now we take the negative of it, we get the heat released by the chemical reaction. And just FYI, for chemical reactions, you can never determine the heat released or absorbed directly. It's always through the surroundings to determine the reaction. And then we notice that the moles of acid is 0.08. So we take the heat of the reaction divided by the moles of acid, we get the uh, delta H. And my apologies, it should be a negative because these should be exothermic. So negative, oops, that's not good. Negative 56,275 or negative 56.3 kilojoules. I forgot to put the minus sign because these are, this will be an exothermic process. One last type of calorimetry is constant volume, uh, excuse me, constant volume calorimetry. So here the volume is kept constant. And this is typically carried out in what's called a bomb calorimeter. So if you take, usually if you take advanced upper level classes like physical chemistry in the labs, they use bomb calorimetry experiments. They're actually pretty cool. You know, some, some labs, what they do is they take different types of candies put them in there to see how much heat is released. And you'd be surprised, like for candy corn, there's actually quite a lot of heat released in the candy corn. There's a little candy corn they used to give out for Halloween. And typically we use uh, bomb calorimeters or bomb calorimetry to measure heat of combustion reactions. Because what you do is you'll put your sample in a, in a, in a, like a bowl, and in the bowl, you're going to stick this in a what's called a, a sealed metal container, which you purge with oxygen, and you combust it to see how much heat is released. So since the change in volume is constant, there's no work done. Oops, that's not look good. There's no work done because delta V is zero, so delta E is equal to the heat at constant volume. And so again, the fundamental principle for bomb calorimetry is that the heat released by the system is absorbed by the calorimeter. Now, the way we find the heat of the calorimeter is a little bit different than the coffee cup. So what we need is C-cal, which is the calorimeter constant. So typically with bomb calorimetry, you assume the water is part of the calorimeter, but sometimes they may give you extra information about the water and the calorimeter. But C-cal is the calorimeter constant. Delta T is the change in the calorimeter's temperature. And then we can determine the heat absorbed by the calorimeter and then the heat released by the system. Let's look at a practice problem. So here where this chemist burns 0 0.8650 grams of graphite in a calorimeter and CO2 is formed. If the heat released per mole of graphite is 393.5 kilojoules and delta T is 2.613 Kelvin, what's the heat capacity of this calorimeter? So the chemist burns 0 0.8650 grams of graphite. For every mole of graphite, this much heat is released. 
And we know the delta T for this experiment was 2.613 Kelvin. So what do we know? We know that Q of calorimeter equals the heat, the calorimeter constant times delta T. So we rearrange this in order to find the calorimeter constant. We need the heat absorbed by the calorimeter and delta T. Well, delta T we already have. It's given to us. It's 2.613 Kelvin. So we got to find the Q of calorimeter so that we can find the calorimeter constant. So first we need to calculate the moles of graphite because we know one mole of graphite releases 393.5 kilojoules of heat. So we found the moles of graphite, that's good, boom. Now we can find how much heat is released because one mole of graphite is 393.5 kilojoules. How many moles of graphite for 0 0.0721? What we do is we multiply and we get the heat released. And this should be a negative, oh no, sorry, yes, yes negative 28.4 because this should be negative 393.5 so the q of reaction is negative 28.4 i skipped a step here so q of reaction negative 28.4 kilojoules. Remember Q of reaction equals negative Q of calorimeter. So Q cal equals negative 28 point four kilojoules and so the calorimeter constant for this bomb calorimeter is 10.9 kilojoules per kelvin look at one last problem involving bomb calorimetry. So in this example, we have 28 grams of a substance. It has a molecular weight of 52 grams per mole placed in a bomb calorimeter, which has a heat capacity of 2.6 joules per degree Celsius. It combusts. We want to find what's the molar heat of combustion. For the substance, if the temperature of the calorimeter went from 25 degrees Celsius to 142 degrees Celsius. So what we're looking for is delta H of combustion, delta H of combustion equals Q of reaction divided by moles of substance, because we don't know what it is. So the moles of substance we can find, moles of substance equals the mass divided by the molar mass. So we got the moles of substance, that's one thing, check. Now we need to determine the Q of reaction. And what we have to remember is that Q of reaction equals negative Q of calorimeter. And Q of calorimeter equals the calorimeter constant times delta T. So do we know delta T? 
Yes. Do we know the calorimeter constant? Yes. So we can find the Q of calorimeter. So delta T equals 142 minus 25, 117. And we know the Q of calorimeter, so now we can calculate Q cal. So it's 2.60 times 117, 304 joules. Yep. So now we know QCAL. Q of reaction is just a negative of that. And now we can find delta H. So delta H is negative 565 kilojoules per mole. And generally with combustion reactions, they're always going to be exothermic, and they usually have an exothermic delta H. So on that note, we finished the first part of chapter six involving energy and calorimetry. Uh, the next lecture will be focused on another way to calculate enthalpy, which will be Hess's law. So again, enthalpy is a state function. It doesn't depend on the path you take. It's just the initial and final states. So the next lecture will be involving Hess's law in the thermochemistry chapter. On that note, till next time. I say goodbye.